Hello, everyone. I'm Ilka Schulman, Technical Specialist in the Disability Inclusion Team in the International Labor Organization. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar on neurodiversity inclusion in the workplace. In today's discussion, we will explore the concept of neurodiversity, discuss proactive neurodiversity adjustments that also benefit all employees, and how to avoid tokenism and stigmatization in neurodiversity in inclusion. We will also introduce the Business and Disability Forum's Neurodiversity Toolkit, which will be available for access to members of the ILO Global Business and Disability Network. In terms of the webinar structure, we will start with a 10-minute presentation of the Business Disability Forum's Neurodiversity Toolkit followed by a conversation with Nancy and Neil for 30 minutes. And then in the last 15 minutes, we will take questions from the audience. Please enter your questions in the Q&A and we will put them forward to the panelists as time allows. Um, we have made available international sign interpretation and closed captioning, which you can access by clicking the CC on the bottom of the screen and a recording will be made available after the webinar. I'd li now like to extend a warm welcome to our panelists and introduce them. We are delighted to have with us Dr. Nancy Doyle, who's the CEO and founder of Genius Within, a social enterprise dedicated to the inclusion and advancement of neurodiversity at work, and a, an organizational psychology research fellow at Burke Beck College, University of London. Welcome, Nancy. We also have with us Neil Milliken, who's the Global Head of Accessibility for Autos. Neil's role is to deliver better technology for customers and employees, embedding inclusive practices into organizational processes. And finally, we have with us Adrian Ward, Head of Disability Partnerships at Business Disability Forum. Adrian leads the team responsible for all of BDF's external relationships with their members and partners. His team is also responsible for the delivery of BDF's consultancy and learning and development services. So welcome to you all, to the panelists and to our audience. And we can now begin uh, the first part of our webinar, which will be the presentation of the BDN Neurodiversity Toolkit by Adrian. Adrian, over to you. Thank you, okay. thank you everyone. Um, nice to be here today. Um, yeah, I'd like to run this session today just to walk people through the Neurodiversity Toolkit and just give people a sense of what's, it's included, what's included within it um, and some of the key functions within that. Um, just for a little bit about myself, as um, Ilka said at the start there, I head up our business partnerships team um, here at Business Disability Forum. So uh, we, we manage all the relationships with our members and partners um, and we, we delivered our consultancy and learning development services within, within this team. Um, for those of you that don't know too much about Business Disability Forum, we are a charity and not-for-profit organisation and um, existed for nearly 30 years now. Um, and our kind of remit and our, our mission is about working with organisations to help create what we call a, a sort of disability smart business or a disability smart organisation. And by that, we mean an organisation that uh, excels at attracting, recruiting and retaining uh, disabled people um, and an organisation that is really thinking about how it delivers its products and services uh, to their customers or their service users in an accessible way. Um, so I'm here today to talk about the Neurodiversity Toolkit, so I wanted to give a little bit of context to start with before I, I share the, my screen and just uh, walk you through what the toolkit looks and feels like. Um, the toolkit came about um, last July, we actually launched it initially, um, and it was actually driven, as a lot of our work is, through our membership, uh, through our members and partners essentially. Uh, and feedback that we'd received is that there, there was a neurodiversity was a subject where people were kind of thirsty for more information and more knowledge uh, and more guidance around around the subject um, and wanted more content uh, around that. So we 
we worked with our members and our partners to develop a toolkit that actually provided that content and information uh, to people. So the toolkit approach is actually about presenting inf information in a smaller bite-sized uh, kind of format. So historically at BDF, we have produced sort of longer guidance documents, maybe in PDF formats. Um, and we took this approach to present information in a, as I say, a shorter bite-sized sort of chunked up uh, approach to make it more, again, more accessible and more user-friendly to our, to our members that, that access it. So we're delighted to have uh, formed a relationship with uh, the ILO for the GBDN uh, members so that you'll be able to access this toolkit uh, as well. So I'm just going to share my screen um, and from there just walk you around what the toolkit looks like. So just to start with, this is sort of the landing page, uh, what we call our knowledge hub on the website. So this is only available to, to member organisations and uh, GBDN members that will access the toolkit through this route. So a simple login process into the into the hub will take you to the neurodiversity toolkit. Uh, you'll see here that there are a range of toolkits here, but for, for GBDN members, you'll go in to see specifically the neurodiversity toolkit because that's the, um, the the arrangement we put in place for yourselves. Now, with all our toolkits that we've produced in the last um, twelve to eighteen months. These toolkits are formed not just by us saying what we think is the right approach and what we think is the right information, but we work with our membership and our um, expert solution providers to help us make sure that that content absolutely is spot on and really resonates with our membership. And the membership will be a cross sector of government organizations, large corporate organizations across many, many different sectors as well. So for this particular toolkit, as well as um, our, our fellow guest speakers on this presentation today, Neil uh, and Nancy from Genius Within, who helped uh, with the content for some of the toolkit, uh, we had a number of other organisations that supported us in the development of this. So you'll see from the list here, organisations such as BBC Cape, Santander, PwC, HSBC, Oracle, uh, Do It Profiler, Genius Within, as I've mentioned, Willis Tower, Watson and Lexic. Um, and they essentially formed part of a steering group that helped develop an input into content and also sense check some of the information that was provided into the content. So we're really pleased that the end product is something that really reflects what our membership is very, um, has, has contributed to, absolutely. So with the toolkit itself, there's a contents page. And this is what, again, as you access this, this is what you will see. You will see the information broken into five key sections, which I'm just going to walk you through in due course. One of the things uh, the focuses of the toolkit is to actually produce information that resonates with different audiences. So we've put information in here that will re resonate with different people in different roles within the organisation, whether that be a senior leader, whether that be someone that has a line manager or a people manager responsibility, somebody that's in maybe a customer service type role, um, or perhaps for colleagues in um, HR professional or diversity and inclusion uh, professional roles. So there's a whole range of different focuses um, for the content that's in there. There's around about 40, just over 40 resources in total. And uh, again, on feedback that we've received, the resources are presented in different styles, essentially. So within there, there are things like podcasts, videos, text, um, PowerPoint presentations to play to a range of different um, learning styles and information gathering styles as well. So I'm not going to today take you through absolutely every resource um, within the section because A, that would probably be information overload and B, we've got some really powerful conversations to be having as part of this as well. So this is really very much about an overview for the toolkit itself. So you get a feel of how to access it and actually what some of the content within that looks and, and feels like. Um, essentially, very easy to use. There's a, a drop down menu button there, which presents you with a list of the resources held within a particular section. So this section being neurodiversity and business. So this is very much aimed at kind of high level um, overviews of the subject of neurodiversity, talking about actually what do we mean by neurodiversity 
and a little bit about the language as well. And I just I wanted to touch very briefly on the language because that was always one of the big discussions when forming the toolkit is actually what was the terminology we should use, what should we call it? Um, and we ended up uh, using the word neurodiversity. But within that and the guidance around uh, language within there, we do reflect that there are different terms and different language that is used around neurodiversity. Some people prefer the term neuro-minority, neuro-atypical, just the abbreviation ND. Um, we actually plumped for the phrase neurodiversity, again, from feedback from our membership, because that's the language that resonated most with that audience and people were most familiar with that. But I think it's always very important to recognise that language evolves and language changes um, and reflect that some people prefer different terminology as well. So that provides a little bit of context around, around that. And a lot of the basis of the toolkit, whilst there is a focus on different conditions, um, the actual main thrust of the toolkit, as you'll see when you go through it, is actually encouraging people not to focus on a condition or a diagnosis, focus more on perhaps the, the barrier that an individual might be encountering and what a line manager or what an organisation can do to help support that individual and where it's required to remove barriers for that individual as well. So whilst it's important to have an understanding um, of the conditions that we are relating to as part of this term neurodiversity, um, it's actually more important to focus on the impact on the individual and therefore perhaps the support and adjustments they might require, whether that be in a workplace context or as a, as a customer or service user. So moving just through into the next section, which is what our people managers need to know. This is probably the section of the tool, toolkit that gets the most hits or the most visits, if I, if I would say, um, mainly because most organisations will have a lot of people managers and therefore there's more people that this subject matter will will resonate with accordingly uh, and some of the focus in this section is again equipping people managers line managers with particular skills around how to have supportive and sensitive conversations with individuals that they might be um, managing um, looking at how to effectively manage performance and that's not managed performance in a negative context that's about actually how uh, fostering an environment where individuals can actually thrive and flourish um, and supporting people's performance accordingly. Um, and then you'll see there's quite a lot of content there around um, adjustments and adjustments uh, relating to specific barriers that people might encounter. So this is about lots of tangible, um, practical advice and guidance that uh, it's aimed at equipping line managers in terms of having that conversation with individuals but also being able to work with that individual to consider practical uh, intervention practical support to, to that person so we're very conscious that adjustments and providing adjustments to remove barriers for individuals is a, is a key factor um, in any organization but particularly that that line manager people manager um, responsibility we then have a section that looks at the customer and service user experience so that section in particular will talk through maybe some of the training requirements that might be needed for people in those kind of uh, customer facing roles, um, how to create the right environments for people that um, to ensure that they, they feel and look neuro inclusive, um, some scenarios around that. And we also include a video in there which uh, walks through the experience of somebody, not just somebody with a neurodiverse condition, but also someone with a, a, a physical condition as well and their experience of being in a shopping environment and actually what good practice looks like in supporting those individuals. So again, that will resonate for people that, that are in that kind of customer service facing role. We then have a broader section that's more geared towards HR professionals and diversity and inclusion professionals. So going into a bit more depth around what people might require um, in those roles. Um, the, there's a couple of documents there in the top two. So there's uh, the checklist for neurodiversity commissioning and how to commission services for supporting neurodiversity at work. Um, so both Neil and Nancy were instrumental in that resource and that, that being included within the, the toolkit. So they might want to talk a little bit more about that um, when we get into the Q&A um, session uh, probably. But a thank you to Neil and to Nancy for their contributions into the, into the toolkit there. Um, and then the final section is an area that we find that really our membership thrive on and really do appreciate. Um, organisations like to hear what other organisations have done well. 
Um, so this section includes uh, a number of case studies, blogs, podcasts of good practice or initiatives that exist within uh, the organizations listed there like BBC, HSBC, um, uh, and a couple of other, Santander as well. So these are real life examples, things that have been put in place uh, within these organizations. It's a great way to learn. It's a great way to, to understand how, what other organizations have done and what worked well and whether they're things that can be replicated in your own organizations as well. I am conscious that that is very much a rapid walkthrough of uh, the talk itself. Um, and we obviously will be able to provide more support and information to colleagues that wish to um, see more about the, the toolkit accordingly. Um, and there will be a process where the um, colleagues from the ILO will be asking yourselves to for your sort of login uh, email paths so that we can uh, set up the registrations for you to be able to access the toolkit um, accordingly. Um, so, but I will be part of the call today. So if there are any questions specifically around the toolkit, we'd love to hear from you. And if there's any questions outside of um, this particular session, equally, we'd love to hear from people around that as well. So I'm gonna hand back to yourself now, Ilka. Excellent, thank you very much. That was a very good brief and comprehensive overview. Very, very much appreciate that, Adrian. Looks very, very interesting. Um, I am sure there will be great interest from the ILO GBDN members, and I believe it's, it will also be available to ILO staff uh, if, for those who are interested. So um, at the end of the, we will remind you, but please do contact GBDN or myself, Shulman at ILO, and we will uh, provide that access to, to the excellent toolkit. And now I would like to move on to the next part of our, uh, of our webinar, which is our conversation with Nancy and with Neil, um, which will consist of about five questions. And um, so we'll start with you, Nancy. Again, welcome. We're delighted to have you here. Thank you. <laughs> nice to be here. Um, excellent. Adrian had just mentioned uh, the, the discussion around the using the concept of neurodiversity and, and so on. It's, it, it's true, it's become an increasingly popular concept and um, it's, it's in the business press and you see a lot of coverage. Can you tell us really what is this concept of neurodiversity and what different groups are covered by it? Okay, so very broadly, um, neurodiversity simply refers to the idea that all humans are diverse in our cognitive profile, in our neurological ability, um, our areas of strength and weaknesses, the things that we do well, the things that we don't do well, for example, visual processing, uh, memory, attention, um, verbal reasoning, abstract reasoning, what we're essentially saying with neurodiversity is that there's, there's a natural variation in human capacity on those variables that is true of all humans. So all of us vary in the same way that our personalities vary um, or the tone of our skin varies or our height varies or our athletic prowess varies. There's variance um, and that, that's normal. Um, neurodiversity uh, uh, originally grew from the concept, that concept kind of grew from the social model of disability, uh, activist, advocate, um, self-advocates self from within the autism community who wanted to explain that autism wasn't necessarily a disability, wasn't necessarily something that was broken, um, that, that, it had, that there were kind of positives to that. And so initially it kind of, it's become a little bit synonymous with, with autism, but actually autism is a neuro minority. It's a condition under that big umbrella and, and there are other neuro minorities, for example, ADHD, dyslexia, dyspraxia or developmental coordination disorder, dyscalculia, um, Tourette syndrome. And, you know, we can make that as broad or as narrow as we need to. If we just focus on the idea that there are variances in, in cognitive style and cognitive um, strengths and weaknesses, then that we can also include um, intellectual and learning disabilities. Um, and mental health conditions because those also occur quite regularly within the human species. And the prevalences of all these conditions are such that we have to assume at some point they are a natural part of human life 
and not necessarily something that should be pathologized or considered solely for its difference or deficit. Is that a good enough explanation? I wish someone had written, I wish we'd, are we recording this? Because that's probably the best one I've given in a while. I do that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> like yes, it's an excellent, excellent <laughs> overview. Just to, just to follow up, uh, how many, uh, what percentage of the population are the estimates um, would fit into this neurodiverse profile? Well, all of us fit into the neurodiverse profile because all oh, humans right. are part of the diversity of neurological profile. But in terms of neurominorities, um, we think one to two percent of the population is autistic. Uh, or around five percent of the population has ADHD. Around 10 percent of the population is dyslexic. Around five dyspraxic. Again, one to two percent with, who have Tourette's. And there are quite a lot of overlaps. You know, those those things that we currently call labels or diagnoses. Um, could also be uh, kind of seen as symptoms and, and they overlap. So you, are, you find a lot of people who are dyspraxic and autistic. So when you add them all up, we're talking about a significant minority. Um, best guesses are around 15 to 15% of the human population has some form of neurominority um, status. And given that it's such a sizable minority, the idea with the neurodiversity movement is that we should be planning for this and we should accommodate it. And we should avoid having all of our big institutional systems dependent on things that neuro minorities find hard. So, for example, literacy being the only route to achievement in education um, when we have such good tools and techniques now that we don't actually need to write things down anymore. But we still privilege literacy as the only gateway to explore uh, higher level cognitive thought. So there are kind of that's that's very much the idea. And that's the, that's, that's the prevalence and that's why that prevalence is something that is becoming more popular because a lot of people identify with it. And if they're not identifying with it personally, then their kids are or their family members are. And so it's become very quickly a, a kind of, um, I mean, I've, I've been working in this field for about 20 years, so it doesn't feel quick to me. Um, <laughs> but over the last five years, I think the reason it's picked up and accelerated is because those prevalences are, are quite sizable. Um, and so therefore it's captured quite a few people's imagination. Right. Well, in my following from that, um, given the prevalence in, in, of, you know, neuro minorities, what, what do you think are the workplace adjustments that need to be considered to ensure full inclusion of neurodiverse staff so that they can be able to work at their best and play to their strengths? And from your response, I will then move on to Neil to, to ask about his specific um, views on that and lived experience perspectives on workplace adjustments. So mm -hmm. if you could start us off, Nancy, on that. Thanks. So, I mean, there are so many different ways to answer that question. There's a kind of tick list of things that people do. Um, uh, and we don't have enough good evidence on that. So at Birkbeck, um, at my university, we've just started a research centre specifically targeted at evaluating the impact of adjustments so that we can get better at recommending the right ones for the right people. So at that individual level, what tends to happen is, is coaching to understand better how to um, optimize memory skills and time management and organization. Those tend to be uh, deficits associated with, with neuro minorities um, and, and also working on playing to strengths so that so that individuals can get over some of the kind of self-esteem and confidence issues. So coaching is often used as a, um, a vehicle to, to the specific individual level adjustments. Uh, a very popular adjustment is um, workplace environment flexibility. So being able to block out background noise, which enhances focus and, con and concentration, um, being able to organize your desk and your lighting in a certain way so that you can play to your, your strengths and kind of maybe have everything out in front of you if you've got visual skills. Um, we also uh, ubiquitously use um, assistive technology and I'm gonna let Neil speak more on that because that is absolutely his area of expertise. And there's some really exciting things happening with the use of assistive technology and how standardized they're becoming to the point where we don't necessarily have to give them to a person to fix that person, one person at a time, but we're going to kind of start baking them in. And I suppose that's my next point. So we know what we can do with individuals at an individual level. It's best done on a bespoke basis, working with somebody who has training and a specialism in this field. Um, but 
what we need to be doing in, in the next wave of neurodiversity and inclusion is looking at how these problems keep arising in the first place. So starting to make adjustments to our standard processes. So do we need to use interviews for all recruitment, for example? Can we start dialing down the interviews and start dialing up the work sample test? Can we have more policies around flex flexible um, working and remote working, particularly now we've just had a worldwide experiment that has shown that actually people can be very effective in a remote context. Um, and, and so things like that, being more flexible in the way we do HR um, can be a, a really, it can be a preventative measure which creates a more systemic inclusion rather than waiting for people to fail and then fixing them at the individual level. And I think those are the kind of two approaches that are um, dynamically working their way through system at the moment. The more we know about what works at an individual level, the more we can bake these things in a standard. But we need to kind of keep doing it and develop our evidence base better. I'll hand over to Neil now. Thanks, Neil. Yeah, if you could uh, pop in and let us know what you, um, can you provide some of your lived experience perspectives? Absolutely. If your colleague could Very allow me to restart my camera, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> the logistics the host has stopped my camera so you can't see me but when the host restarts my camera I'll be here and I'll have a big ta-da moment <laughs> uh, so um, yeah so I just want to sort of echo some of the things that uh, that Nancy has has already said that um, you know, I come from lived experience of, of neurodiversity I am part of a neuro minority in fact several uh, so I, I, I was diagnosed with dyslexia a long time ago, also diagnosed with ADHD. There is an enormous amount of crossover and interplay between the two. So when we are talking about all of those percentages, you know, they're not cumulative. They're, they're we, you know, we need to sort of think about a figure somewhere uh, in the middle of that sort of list of things rather than sort of add everything up and go, yes, it's 40 percent in neuro minorities. It's not that large. However, it is still a very significant part of our population. Uh, and we exist and we're part of your workforce already, uh, uh, but at the same time, we still need certain things to make us effective. And so, um, so from a lived experience point of view of, of sort of what workplace adjustments work, I think that does depend on which neuro minority that you sit in or which combination of those, because the different traits of different neuro minorities have varying different needs, but you know common themes about allowing people you know to focus and concentrate, making sure that we um, communicate in the way that is appropriate for the individual. So I, I work with a number, being you know a neuro minority myself, and then working with others in my my team, I have different ways of communicating with different people to meet their communication preferences, and one of the things we do when we onboard someone is actually agree the sort of parameters as to how we communicate and 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 how we like to be addressed and how we work so that we can be effective so those are the sort of if you like soft adjustments then there are technology so for me for example organization is a big thing uh time management and all this kind of stuff so the very very basics of things like um outlook or you know something that has your calendar your reminders all of this kind of stuff is absolutely crucial because time management is is really important to me and has become more important as I've become more senior within my organization and I have more de you know demands for my time it's really easy for me to book a meeting on a Sunday instead of a Monday to get it the, all of the times mixed up especially when I'm working in a large organization that crosses multiple time zones so uh, calendar management I actually get help with this now so I have I have assistance with this but but also um, there are, you know, inbuilt tools. So using the tools that are available, so Outlook or Google Calendar, these things are really very, very helpful in having some structure in place. Things like um, mind mapping tools for for sort of getting your ideas down rapidly. I've used for about twenty years, as I have also with speech recognition. So for me, I'm very able to communicate my ideas verbally but when it comes to typing it becomes much harder I use a lower vocabulary because actually my brain can't process the sort of 
how to use the keyboard and how to express myself very well at the same time. So speech recognition is really, really helpful. Uh, and, and in fact, that combination of mind mapping to get my ideas down, being able to manipulate them, order them visually, and then dictate stuff was how I got through my masters and how I still do a lot of my sort of more sort of writing when I'm, I'm writing for blogs or, or white papers or, or whatever. Um, in terms of the built environment, Nancy mentioned some of the adjustments in terms of lighting, etc. We've also done things like um, creating zones where people can be quiet in our offices and having sort of furniture that's designed to cocoon people, as, as, as assigned offices to people that really uh, can't deal with the sort of open plan environment. And, and I would be one of those. Um, allowing people to work from home. I've worked from home for six years um, and you know the technology is there to enable people to communicate and, and to, to be effective. And I think that the pandemic has only reinforced that. So whereas before, I think organizations were skeptical, you know, this, this 10 month experiment in remote and flexible working has really proved that it's absolutely possible to do this. Um, and then in terms of other tools, there's an awful lot um, of stuff that is happening right now in terms of text-to-speech, um, AI tools that can help you remember to do stuff uh, right now, which is um, which is really very, very helpful. So, uh, for example, the tools that are built into some of the Microsoft products like uh, Immersive Reader will give you your text-to-speech highlighting, your, um, you, know, you can break stuff up but into syllables and, and, and so on. You can change the colors of backgrounds and foregrounds and fonts because glare may be a problem. Um, you've obviously got captions and so on built in. They can be helpful, but also I find that um, with my ADHD, I'm quite often distracted by reading the captions and spend more time looking at the words appearing on the screen than concentrate on what's being said. So again, we have to be mindful that that even within the neuro minorities, we're a very diverse group. So, so there is an awful lot of customization. And I think that we'll you know, give time for the other questions because I think there's an awful lot of rich questions still to come. Excellent, that's super uh, interesting. And, and they seem, you, these adjustments you both talk about seem very doable and, and a, a rich variety um, of adjustments that can that can be done fairly easily, it seems to me. So, um, my next question to follow on this to, to you, Neil, would be: What are the benefits and challenges um, for companies in neurodiversifying their workforces? I mean, what do companies get out of it, and what are some things to look out for? Over to you. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I, I think that you know we as a community bring divergence of thought, new ways of thinking. Um, one of the reasons why companies fail is groupthink. Um, what you won't get with uh, with neurodivergent people is groupthink. You will get different ideas, and, and I think that that is really the lifeblood of innovation. So, um, so if companies really want to challenge the way they work now, that do creative problem solving and, and um, actually not sort of just get stuck in a rut, then you want to engage your neurodiverse workforce. And, and of course, we're, we're already employed. We would love to have more employed. There is quite a lot of uh, the, the working population that hasn't disclosed and will come on to self-identification and identification at work I know later in this chat. Um, so what are the, the, the benefits? I think they're manifold. You know, we, you get people that really love doing what they're doing. You know, if you can align with someone's uh, specialist interest, like for me, you know, accessibility, we'll just keep going you know we're like the energizer bunny um that there is no stopping us when we're, we're on a roll with this kind of stuff so that's all positive at the same time we'd be pretty bad at certain things because we have these spiky profiles so the expectation i think in a lot of uh, organizations over the last couple of decades is we've we've kind of homogenized jobs as um it has come along we've 
we've got rid of specialisms and everybody has become much more generalist. So you're expected to be able to do a lot of your own administration work. You're expected to do your own time management, your, your sort of finances, your planning, because you have spreadsheets now, so you can do that. So, um, and, and these requirements to do all of these generalist administrative things or, or other parts of the sort of company life that would have been carried out by a specific function can be challenging for your neurodivergent population at work. So that means that we have to find ways to enable people and, and take that away to enable people to shine. And, and, and that is where we have the challenges because we have a management challenge in terms of uh, mindsets, processes, the, you know, this is the way we do things around here. It's always been this way. We're not going to change. And, and then we also have the sort of, the the policy around it, making sure that we've got the right HR processes and, and all of the rest of it to support managers that, that want to do this as well. Because it's whilst it's a concept that has grown rapidly in, in popularity, uh, I don't think that necessarily companies' processes and policies have really kept up, which is why there's a need for the course, uh, the toolkit. So um, so so those are some of, some of the challenges. And then in terms of IT, actually. Um, supporting assistive technology in an enterprise environment is not as simple as giving it to someone on their home computer, simply because of the way that uh, enterprise environments are configured. Things like speech recognition get their hooks deep into the operating system and do things like copy paste. Now, if you work for a, a, an organization that is uh, security conscious, they've probably got data loss protection software, which can interfere with the assistive tech. So there's a whole piece around making sure that you do interoperability uh, and your sort of due diligence and support with the assistive tech. So, so those are some of the, the real challenges to put sort of putting in place the workplace adjustments. Um, they are absolutely surmountable. All of these things can be done. It's a matter of will and planning. So I think that's probably you know, enough for this little potted segment. But, uh, and, and I'm sure you've got a, a number of questions to follow up with Nancy. Absolutely, Nancy. Um, yes, did, do you have something you wanted to add to this, this point um, or should we move on to the next question about the autism work program? I think, um, I think Neil's been incredibly comprehensive, but I've just been kind of uh, going in and out of the Q&A and people have been talking about, you know, is it all one person at a time or, you know, is it really that we, you know, is there so much difference that we have to focus on one per person at a time? And I think yes and no, you know, what, what we do at Genius Within is we have a stepped process. So there's a bunch of stuff which is likely to be useful for most people. And you can kind of build that into your HR frameworks with the right consultancy. It has to be reasonable. So you have to kind of look at that intersection between how you operate as a business and what your business or organizational goals are versus the needs of a of, of variety of individuals and work out how you could operationalize those things. Um, and then we use a, a questionnaire, an adjustment screener. We call it, you know, the, we just call it a strategy profiler. So what kind of strategies might work for you as an individual? And it's free, it's on our website. Um, so you just go on our website, you put in the kind of problems you're having, and it comes up with a list of adjustments. And those are kind of standard things for, that work for most people. And around 15 to 20 percent of people who do that don't need any further expertise. And you can do that with your supervisor or with someone from human resources or personnel and sit and go through the questionnaire with you and sit, to, you know, get the output with you going, oh, these are, here's a bunch of things. Let's get those in place. And that starts a conversation. It's a very nice way of doing it. That sorts out, you know, a good proportion of the people who are going to need adjustments. Um, and then we go to the next step up, which is to kind of debrief that questionnaire with a psychologist on the phone, which is a kind of lesser, not very expensive intervention, but it does get you a bit of specialist advice. And then we only go to a kind of more expensive form of adjustment if all of those things haven't worked. So, but, it, but even if those things don't work, it still puts the ability to change and start influencing your environment right back in the, in the hands of the individual employee and the employer. So you can start having useful conversations and making progress, even if you haven't solved the whole problem yet. So that's 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 what we recommend is a kind of step process. A lot of things in neuro minorities, particularly in education, this kind of drives me crazy in education, 
which is that the system is set up to start with the most expensive thing, which is a, a detailed assessment with a you know highly qualified and trained professional. And I just think don't bring in the big guns till you need them. <laughs> you know, save those for, for when you absolutely need them. Let's do less expensive up, ex assessments up front that might actually just give you three bullet points of advice that most people could have told you and start with the three bullet points of advice and then scale them up if you need to. That's that's where I think we should be going in, in work and education, but I'm not gonna go there yet. Okay, excellent. <laughs> very useful, very useful points um, to both of you. Thank you so much. Um, I'll move on to the next question. I'm very conscious of time. We, I mean, we could keep going uh, if, if we could, but uh, we have to end punctually. Um, my next question is to you, Nancy. There are a number of, um, examples of autism at work programs, hmm. like at SAP or ENY, many other companies that have been launched in companies. Um, can you explain your view of these programs? <clears throat> so I have um, a, a kind of a professional critique of these programs and I'm working on developing a more objective assessment of them using interviews and surveys. That's a project that's currently being undertaken at my research center. My, so my professional critique is questions at this stage rather than, um, you know, don't take it as fact. But my questions around them are around disclosure. So you're having people come in on a program where they're automatically disclosing to anyone else in the organization who happens to know which department they work in, something quite personal, something that would be considered medical grade data about themselves. And I think that puts individuals in those programs in a bit of an odd position with regard to ongoing promotion opportunities, sideways moves, you know, how they may be subject to stereotype threats about what they're capable of going forward. And that's a concern that I have. I also have a concern and a question around access to those programs and whether or not they represent segregation rather than access. So if the autism at work programs are not available to dyspraxic people or ADHD people or people with sensory processing disorder, like what's the barrier for entry? Mm -hmm. We had a, I had a question that I've been, I've been answering questions in the chat. So sorry, I hear my camera's shaking. I apologize for that. I've been answering questions. Um, but I had a question in the, in the chat about a, a, dis, you know, a disability entry program, which is quite broad. So, you know, a program for disabled, psychologists wanting to come into um, the organization and something quite broad like that where you're targeting um, a group of people that are underrepresented is completely fine it's called positive action it's a legal kind of uh, term that means you can kind of you're discriminating you're saying you can only come in if you are disabled but you're doing it in a very targeted way but it's still quite broad I worry that autism at work programs are too narrow when we're only targeting autism and we're not saying generally speaking, uh, you know, that's that we, we're on the edge of discrimination there, I think. Um, and, and, and we're on the, the edge of limiting who can apply. Then there's a further complication to that, which is that autism is a diagnosis that people tend to get if they are well resourced. So if you are um, a black indigenous person of color, if you are female, you are less likely to have an autism diagnosis. And that's not because you're less likely to have autism, it's because the medical and clinical processes for diagnosis are expensive and biased. And then they're known to have systemic biases in them um, that discriminate against race and gender. So you are undermining other forms of inclusion by targeting autism only and by targeting technology only. <laughs> So the, the, the combination of those two factors means that you're basically top slicing um, fairly white male privileged people for fairly white male privileged jobs. And that's not really the spirit of the neurodiversity movement, which is inclusion for all. So that's problematic. Um, and I think, you know, when you add all those things up together, the way I see the autism at work programs is that essentially they should operate like pilots. And what we should be saying is, okay, so we've run this autism at work program. And what we've discovered is that actually autistic people who weren't coming into the company using standard recruitment techniques, we found a way to let them in. Once they came in, they actually turned out to be quite good at the job. It was awesome, you know, it worked really well. 
what this tells us is that our recruitment wasn't right. It shouldn't tell us that we keep having these special favors for autistic people. What it should tell us is, well, what can we learn from this project about the way we do recruitment and what was wrong with recruitment in the first place that meant we kept excluding a bunch of people who turned out to be really good at the job. So flipping that kind of individual level um, privilege or you know a, a adjustment, flipping the adjustment for individuals back into something that's a, a more systemic, uh, systemically inclusive process. And that's where I think the autism at work paradigm needs to move to. I think we, we're stuck in pilots. So we've done some pilots, it's been great. It's made people feel really good about themselves. But if we keep doing it at, part, at pilot level and stop taking those lessons and turning them into inclusion processes, then we're at risk of being performative um, as opposed to authentic in our, in our inclusion mission. Great. Thank you. That's very, very interesting, very helpful. I'm going to switch now to Neil. This is our last question before we go to the Q&A. Um, Neil, um, many persons that are part of the neurodiversity spectrum will already be working, but might not have disclosed their situation to their employer. What would be your, your advice, both to companies as well as individuals on this? Okay, so um, I think that a lot of this is down to culture. Uh, and I think that just, I'd quite like to sort of just reference the points that, that Nancy just made. Uh, essentially, if we are only running these pilot programs, um, you're constraining people to a certain view and a certain role. And so uh, one of the things that we need to do as organizations is signal that as a neurodivergent person, as a neuro minority, you, the world is open to you. Our, our world of work is open to you. You can have a career in all sorts of different ways. What we want to do is, is, is play people to their strengths and put in place systems that don't prevent people from contributing fully. So when you have a a culture and a program within your organization, you're going to get people feeling more comfortable to do this. At the same time, you still need role models. You still need leadership at the top. So I know that we have you know, senior managers with disabilities within our organization that don't disclose and that we are not alone in this, that this is common among senior managers in all organizations, partly because age and disability are interrelated. So as you get older and as you climb the management hierarchy, you're more likely to acquire disability, long-term health condition, et cetera. But also there is still a notion of, in order to be a senior manager, you must be infallible. You must be the superhuman. You must not be weak. When actually what we need for the 21st century is authentic leadership. We want people to be real. We need people to be real about who they are, their strengths and their weaknesses. And people follow those kind of leaders. But that is a, you know, a cultural generational shift in how organizations are, are managed. Some have already adopted it, but others are still sort of finding their way along that path. And in large organizations where you, you know, span many countries, cultures differ again between countries. So you really need the re really top level leadership from the you know, people like Satya Nadella at Microsoft signaling that it's okay to do this. You know, um, making, you know, getting you know, people to come and talk about their conditions, having you know, uh, those role models active and promoted and for people to see that, that being out about your neurodiversity isn't going to be career limiting because at the moment a lot of people stay in the closet because they believe that coming out will be career limiting so those are the things that really need to change so from from a company point of view you've got to walk the talk and actually start talking about it at the very first thing is say yes we support this and then from an indiv individual point of view you know if you're in middle management if you've progressed mentor people come out talk about it be brave you know group together because I, what happens is you get the sort of momentum so i i was for a while complaining that i was the only you know 
openly out senior disabled manager within my organization that's changed we have you know we have people that identify as disabled we have svps that identify as dyslexic and are role models and sponsors and those people then mentor the next generation and that's how we then start changing the culture and i think that that, that sort of role modeling mentoring sponsorship and then as nancy says systematizing this into our recruitment processes, into our promotion and our training and all the rest of it, is how we create a neuro-inclusive culture. Excellent. Very good. Nancy? Could I just come in on, just to follow on from what Neil said, I think that's really interesting, Neil, um, from your experience in a large company. The um, uh, One of the things I've been doing recently is reading up the research on adjacent fields of inclusion to kind of see what we can learn, you know, what's worked in other areas. So I've done quite a deep dive onto racial inclusion. And one of the things that's been found in, in racial equity work in businesses is that if you want to include, if you want to increase uh, the number of minoritized races that are within your organization, so you want to improve representation in your organization, there are two things that work. Basically, one is making managers accountable for inclusion. Um, and it's not something they're allowed to kind of just, you know, they're not allowed to have all white teams anymore. Um, and the other one is coaching and mentoring. And those are the two things that work in um, improving racial equity. And I think those are really good lessons for us to learn in the neurodiversity move. But my third for that would be assistive technology. <laughs> so that's where we're different. We need the technology as well. Yes. Excellent. Well, let me jump into the, the, uh, the Q&A because we're running out of time, but um, this is a fascinating discussion. I'd love to keep going uh, if, if we could, but <laughs> we'll, uh, we need to move on to the questions now. Um, you've already picked up on a few of them, Nancy. I, I know you said you scrolled through. Uh, here's one that um, from Chloe, it says, um, several organizations, especially in the public service, uh, Hold on a second, let me see. Have policies to accommodate officials with disabilities based on the broad definition given of neurodiversity. Would it be accurate to say that neurodiversity is most definitely a condition that requires a, an accommodation despite not necessarily being considered a disability? What do you recommend to employers to adjust their policies to make sure neurodiverse employees are accommodated? Who should we start with? Uh, Neil, would you like to? Okay, so um, you don't necessarily have to have a disability to be covered by the law. So you can have protected characteristics and some, so you may not identify as disabled as a neuro minority, but you still have characteristics that, that protect you under things that in, under the Equality Act in the UK and under similar legislation in other countries that give you certain rights. And I think that there is still a lack of understanding of that, both by individuals who you know, don't know their own rights and organizations that don't really understand the implications of the legislation and that you don't actually have to have a formal diagnosis of a disability in order to um, have the rights under the law. So, so those are things that, that need to change. There's a, definitely a piece of education on that and and also I think the whole sort of medicalization legalization of these things are actually counterproductive because actually what we want is to enable organizational effectiveness and individual effectiveness so if we look at management theory and 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 so on we're looking at changing the way that we manage as as organizations to be much more outcome oriented and that's actually positive for neurodivergence because actually then we can choose how we deliver those outcomes if we deliver does it matter how we do it does it matter how we communicate how we dress for the most part no so rather than think about you know, presenteeism which of course covid has blown away uh, and and sort of hours on the clock start moving towards these things start talking about organizational and employee effectiveness and then i think we can start having positive conversations a lot of this is about reframing what we need to do I rather than being agree. confrontational i quite agree it's not necessarily about complying with the law and doing something because you have to it's about asking all employees what can we, how can we support you to work at your best? 
how can we support you to work at your best? Here's all the things that we have on offer. Here's all the things that we've tried before. These are the flexibilities that we've built in our system. Are there any of these that you could avail yourself of that would allow you to do your job better and to the fullest of your potential? How can we remove the obstacles from you performing at your best? Because that's really what an accommodation and an adjustment is. And I think if we did more of that, we would need less um, expensive reactions to people that are struggling. Okay, excellent. We have, uh, I think, time for one more question uh, from the Q&A box. Uh, here's one on COVID from Eva. Um, how does COVID and home office influence neurodiverse workforce? Um, and then there's a question around need for more software help. But I guess basically is this idea of, you know, COVID and um, how has that really, um, how can we leverage the changes in the workplace resulting from COVID-19 for better minority inclusion. Nancy, do you want to start? Yeah, I wrote a for I write for Forbes and I wrote a Forbes article on this at the height of the um, first wave crisis. And uh, it's my most popular Forbes blog to date. Uh, and it's called, um, we are all disabled now. And, and what the pandemic has taught us about the social model of disability, where so many people were flung into a situation where they had to communicate in a different way and how disorientating that was um, to suddenly have your standard methods of communication upended and changed overnight and, and how that's kind of similar to the process of, of being disabled. Um, and, and I think, you know, there are winners and losers in this. I have a, a colleague um, who works um, in, a, in a large tech company and in that same period, he called me and he said, he said, I've been working at home remotely for years and all of a sudden my diary is absolutely full of extroverts who want video calls <laughs> um, and it does you know it is about managing the sensory environment so I have ADHD and I'm a, I'm a visual processor and I find it really hard to process by sound alone I can't do that so if, I've, if I'm being asked to do a, um, a conference call where there's no video and there's four, more than three people on a call I literally cannot process the information fast enough to make a contribution uh, whereas other people find the video overwhelming and you have a, a, you know, a team meeting with five or six people and there's all these videos going on. And that's too much. For people. So I think it's I think, I think what the pandemic has done is really highlight how these different forms of communication enable or disable us um, in terms of how we do our best. It's shown us how flexible we need to be. Um, and it's really taught us about kind of negotiating those flexibilities and compromising and working out when we need to orientate around one method or another method, depending on the purpose. And, and so I think, but I think the thing that it's done that the most beautiful job of is that no disabled employee is, is really ever going to be told again that remote working is not reasonable. <laughs> and that all by itself is a big win. For the disability community um, so many advantages for remote working for people who need to avoid commuting because of physical disability sensory impairment um, simply the overwhelming process of the noise of commuting and the crush of commuting for lots of neuro minorities that's an issue so simply being able to work from home more will make a huge difference to uh, the power of disabled contribution in the workplace i think Great. Neil, do, do you want to add anything? I think we have 30 seconds. Uh, yeah, okay, so... I'll have to close it up, uh, close up our... I, I agree with most of the points that Nancy's made. It is, um, it's not all pros, you know, it's not all pros, but there's a lot of benefits, like she said, for the overall disability community and flexibility. I think that the difficulties people have had in getting some of the things set up and moving their adjustments from the office to home have have been challenging for organizations but that's started to come out in the wash and being resolved now um but i also think that there will be a, a sort of recognition that there will need to be some kind of ability to come to a halfway house between the the everything remote and and in person because actually as a one of the things i really like is in-person stuff and um the the intensity of like 16 back-to-back -back phone conferences is causing burnout 
you know, a lot of people are feeling quite burned out. And then the final thing is ergonomics. Not everyone is privileged enough to have a good home working set up. Mm. And that's going to have an impact on people's physical and mental health in the long term. Oh, absolutely. Anyone who's trained to be an osteopath or a chiropractor in the last few years is going to be kids in, aren't they? In a few months time, <laughs> it's going to be back cracking central. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Well, listen, thank you. I, I, we have to close our, our uh, webinar. Uh, we're, it's almost uh, 2.30. And I just want to thank you all, um, Neil and Nancy, so much for your contributions today, and, and as well as Adrian for the overview and the introduction, the launch of the Neurodiversity Toolkit for ILO GBDN members. Much appreciate all your expert insights you shared, and it's been truly a very rich discussion. So thank you. And thanks also to the audience for listening and engaging through your questions. We will collect all any of the unanswered questions and follow up on those that we've not been able to respond to directly today. We will make an available a recording on, um, of this webinar and put it on the ILO website. And then, of course, I want to thank uh, the, the live, captioner, uh, uh, live captioners, international sign language interpreters whose services have been invaluable. And apologies for some of the issues on the captioning. We do apologize. There were some technical def difficulties getting that um, uh, launched in. So we do apologize for that. And again, last word for all um, ILO GBDN members, if you're interested in access to the Neurodiversity Toolkit, please send an email to the network or to me at shulman at ilo.org and we will make sure you have access and to your employees. Again, thanks to all, have a good rest of the day and stay safe and well. <laughs>